Let's break down BYU Nebraska with our good friend from ESPN, former BYU national champion Trevor Maddich. We are back. Maddich Mondays have returned. Trevor, welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Spencer, Jerem, boy, what a day to be back, huh? Absolutely. It's great to talk to you again. So we want your raw reaction and just the the emotion that you felt after seeing that first play, or that last play, rather, from Tanner Mangum to Mitch Matthews. You want my raw reaction, right? Yep. Here, here, here it is. Oh! Woo-hoo! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> that, that pretty much uh, that was clarified. That was perfect. It, it was unbelievable. I mean, I, I was at ESPN. I'm, I'm here now in Bristol, Connecticut. I was in the green room all surrounded by a bunch of college football analysts. We're watching eight different games, but I'm watching one. And, and, and I'm thinking, oh, no, oh, no, it slipped away. You know, it slipped away, and uh, I was thinking of the reasons why it may have slipped away, but then I thought, you know what, these guys never quit, and and it won't be over until it's over, and lo and behold, uh, the Angels were singing, and when that ball came down, you know, the BYU won that game from the offensive perspective for the same reason they were in that game from the offensive perspective. A big wide receiver went up and beasted the ball away from a Nebraska defensive back. And I'll tell you what, man, breaking down that play feels such thin gruel compared to what I felt when I saw it, which was, yeah, woo yeah! <laughs> so, anyway... <laughs> <laughs> ESPN's Trevor Maddich joining us on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Maddich Mondays have returned. Man, that was the reaction from everybody. And it, because it was, Taysom Hill was hurt again. BYU was going to lose that game. And then all of a sudden, the Mangum miracle happens. So you're a sophomore in 1980. Jim McMahon connects with Clay Brown. You're on the field for that, I assume, right? Yeah, I was on the sideline with the best seat in the house. On the sideline. Okay. So what juxtapose those two, two great plays in BYU history. You know what? They, they, they both were huge plays. <clears throat> Where this one leads, we'll see, because the, that play to Clay Brown in 1980 – was another big catalyst forward. BYU had been making springs forward over the last several years, you know, with Gary Scheide, quarterback, and then here comes Mark Wilson, and now Jim McMahon. And that SMU team was no joke. I mean, they put half that team into the NFL. As a matter of fact, one of my teammates in my first team, the Patriots, was Craig James, who was a running back on that team. And the coach was Dante Scarnecchia, who was an assistant coach for that SMU team. And Craig couldn't even talk to me about that play for years. And Dante would talk, but he always had this sad look. I mean, it affected that SMU team, and it affected BYU because it was another concrete reason to believe that BYU belonged, and then BYU continued up from there. Well, this this play, this game, has that feeling, and if BYU, you know, wins a lot more, they don't win a lot more, whatever, this particular play has that same feeling that BYU belongs, and that it is worth the fight to stay in there and keep fighting for what all teams need to make a run at championships, which is that one hot quarterback and stay healthy at the end, because BYU otherwise, BYU can play. Trevor Maddich of ESPN with us on BYU Sports Nation. Let's talk about the quarterback position. Taysom Hill, obviously the worst news that anybody could hope for. He's done for the season for a third time. The dude just cannot catch a break, but in comes Tanner Mangum. And the, the kid just exudes poise and confidence. Break down the quarterback situation right now at BYU. Well, I'll tell you, it seems like quarterback U might be back. You kind of have that that feeling. I don't want to put it on them yet, but you have that feeling because nationally, Taysom Hill is widely recognized as being an elite playmaker. BYU quarterback, elite playmaker, excellent. But when he went out and in comes Tanner Mangum, uh, you know, three months ago, he was he was in Chile saying things like, uh, you know, quiere uh, escuchar. Donde esta, yeah. amigo? <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. And uh, he was just talking about his faith. All of a sudden, he shows up, and he engineers that kind of a comeback. It leads you to believe that, uh, that BYU has got quarterbacks stacked up again. And pe- keep in mind, and I had to remind people out here this, I know we, everybody's familiar with it in Provo, that coming out of high school, Tanner Mangum was co-MVP of the Elite 11 camp with a guy named Jameis Winston. Now, Winston went straight to Florida State and won the Heisman Trophy. Mangum 
ended up in Chile on a church mission, and now he's back to do his thing. But according to the, the performance coming out of high school, he certainly had that kind of a performance in that Elite 11 camp. Now, when I break down his performance, uh, what I see is a guy who has lots of poise, long on poise, short on knowledge of the offense. He's got a lot to learn relative to where to go with the ball on time rather than just see a guy open and throw it up to him, you know, anticipating and throwing it before the guy comes open is what he'll need to, to develop. And that comes with knowledge of the offense in practice, and that only comes with time. But fortunately, BYU has got four or five wide receivers that are between 6'4 and 6'6. So you can actually do that and throw it up to him. So it was the poise that was really the only thing that, that Mangum had to control in this game, and that was brilliantly controlled by him. And that just gives me such encouragement for the future, even this season, even without Taysom. The wide receivers were the talk of fall camp. They really were. That they were fantastic, that BYU had tons of options, and they proved themselves. They were exactly that on Saturday. Nick Kurtz flies under the radar. He goes five catches for a buck 23 and draws a uh, pass interference in the end zone. Uh, Mitch Matthews, obviously, with the two touchdowns. It looks like Tanner Mangum, Trevor, has some serious options at wideout this season. Yeah, he does. And and because you've got so many guys that are so tall and can make plays, it, it causes matchup problems for defenses because they'll have a, a defender, a corner, that'll be able to cover Mitch Matthews, at least at least complicate things for Mitch. But then the second guy's got to cover the next guy that's 6'4 and up. The third guy's got to cover the next tall guy, and the fourth guy's got to cover the next tall guy. So really, where you make your money as a quarterback is not always trying to throw it to your to your number one receiver, but understanding where the best matchup lies. And they've got options now in those matchups because of the fact they've got so many tall guys that can jump out, out of the building and make a play. Trevor Maddich of ESPN with us on BYU Sports Nation. As we look at this game from a logistics standpoint in terms of the pass-to-run ratio, BYU throws for a combined 300 79 yards. The offensive line protected very well against the talented Nebraska defensive line, but there was a lack of a run game. Most of BYU's run yards came on that last drive from Adam Hine. So I don't want to overreact to either one, Trevor, but where should we be looking at this run to pass dynamic? Uh, It's fine. You know, it was interesting. Mike Leach is a BYU guy. You know, he went off to become the pirate of Texas Tech. He's up at Washington State now. But I was talking to him about balance. And most people think balance means you run the ball and pass the ball equally. That's not what Mike Leach thinks. Mike Leach thinks balance is you spread the ball around to a lot of different playmakers and the best way to get it to them. And that means if you throw the ball 50 times and run it 10, okay. It's just a matter of spreading the ball around. And keep in mind also that that Robert and I, the BYU offensive coordinator, was an assistant coach under Mike Leach and also at Rich, Rich, with Rich Rodriguez at the University of Arizona. So he fully understands the concepts of air raid. He came from BYU. He started at right guard in the national championship season. Um, and so he's got an understanding of the way that Lavelle Edwards-style passing attack works. And by the way, the Mike Leach air raid borrows a lot from what Lavelle Edwards did. A lot of the complex that Leach uses, he learned from Lavelle Edwards. So there's a, there's a coaching tree here that, that stems out from Lavelle, and Robert and I is very much part of it. Now you add to that the fact that Robert understands offensive linemen, what they can and cannot do. That'll tell you that he'll be able to call plays based on the matchup on the other side of the ball to give the best team the best. The, excuse me, to give the team the best chance to move the ball in a given situation. And so, you know, the run pass balance is less interesting to me than the uh, the way that they attack a defense because you don't want to get hard headed and say, well, we've got to run the ball no matter what. Well, not necessarily. You know, you've got to spread the ball around, but your running backs don't have to get their touches by trying to run it through a brick wall every time. You can throw it to them around or over that brick wall if you feel like you need to. So I wouldn't get too caught up in the run-pass balance. Now we look at BYU hosting Boise State in a wideout first home game of the season. The kid from Boise playing Boise State. What are some of the storylines going into Saturday's game in your mind? Well, you know, Boise is a very good team, and they're very strong defensively. And so BYU, I think, will have to run the ball a little bit better now that I've said all that in order to be able to slow down the pass rush a bit. But 
I'm very encouraged that even though they, their running backs did not have a good day running against Nebraska, the offensive line still was able to provide good time to throw, especially when Nebraska knew that BYU had to throw. Nebraska's got a couple of defensive tackles that are bound for the NFL. I mean, they, BYU won't face a better bunch on the, on the interior defensive line all season than they were able to – to keep out of the pocket for the most part against Nebraska. Now, Boise will bring in a very aggressive, confident bunch. Uh, but from a standpoint of the storylines in this game, I think it's a matter of BYU just, just settling in and doing what, they've always, what they did to beat Nebraska, which is always focus on the next play and don't get freaked out when things go bad. I think you had reason, if you're a BYU player, to trust your coaching staff. Down the stretch when BYU needed some stops, the Bronco Mendenhall dialed up some run blitzes that were brilliant. I was just looking at them a few minutes before you guys called here this morning. And, you know, one of them that was a third and one with about six minutes to go in the game, Nebraska was set up with a numbers advantage to the right side of the offense. But Bronco had the, the run blitz set up to the to the left side of the offense because, lo and behold, pre-snap, the H-back came into motion, came over to that side of the ball, and they ran the ball into the teeth of what Bronco anticipated would happen. The players look at that, and they have a whole lot of, a lot of confidence. I think if you step back and look at the big picture overall, though, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. And, you know, BYU's got a very, very tough schedule here. But remember back in 1984 when, when we faced Pitt in the season opener, on ESPN, it was a um, it was ranked in the top five in the nation, and it was hard to imagine uh, an undefeated season that year because we, it was hard to imagine getting past Pitt. But once we did, that belief began to skyrocket. BYU's got the entire month of September to go before they can start to have any kind of belief like that because after Boise, they're at UCLA and at Michigan. But Boise is a winnable game for the Cougars, and so if they can focus in and win this one, things start to get very interesting. Trevor, I cannot tell you how good it is to have you back on the show, my friend. Football is back, and you brought it today. Well, you know what? I, football is back. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just one game. It's a long season. But my final thought is this. Yeah! Woo-hoo! <laughs> oh, I got it! Yeah! Go Cougars! <laughs> Trevor, thanks for the time. <laughs> All right, guys.